Welcome back to our Dan Heart and Health series as it relates to diving. We're busy with chapter 2 which consists of five parts and we dealt with part 1 which was the overview and now we're going to be looking at part 2 of chapter 2 which is hypertension. Keep watching. Hypertension or high blood pressure is a common medical condition in the general population as well as amongst divers. Blood pressure is a measure of the force with which blood is pushed out from the heart into the arteries. A blood pressure reading is really a ratio of two numbers. The top number is also called the systolic pressure. That's when your heart is pumping and forces blood into the arteries. The lower reading is the reading when your heart relaxes between beats. That is really, if you like, the lower level ongoing constant pressure that is in the cardiovascular system. And it's useful sometimes to think about hypertension like the temperature in a car engine. The higher the temperature is, the greater the chances are of wear and tear. And the analogy of blowing a gasket would be a cardiac event or a myocardial infarction. Now the unit of measurement of blood pressure is typically millimeters of mercury like a barometer. Now just to give you an idea, one atmosphere is 760 millimeters mercury and a typical blood pressure measurement would be 120 millimeters mercury when the heart is pumping over 80 millimeters mercury. So this is often referred to as 120 over 80. The criteria for a diagnosis of hypertension vary slightly from country to country, even from reference to reference. The table that you can see here shows the typical criteria that are used in the United States. And they show that a blood pressure reading that is less than 120 over 80 typically would be associated with a lower risk. Prehypertension is between 120 and 139 over 80 to 89. Stage 1 hypertension, 140 to 159 over 90. Stage 2 hypertension, 160 or higher over 100. Or a hypertensive crisis, which is then higher than 180 over 110 or higher. Now statistically 78 million American adults or 31 percent which is about one in three have hypertension and it's very obvious or at least very reasonable to conclude that the same would be true in other countries that follow the same sort of diet and lifestyle and therefore it is presumed true in our country as well. Now amongst those who have hypertension, 69% of those that have a first heart attack also have hypertension. 77% of those who have a first stroke and 74% who develop chronic cardiac or heart failure have hypertension. It's also a major risk factor for kidney disease. 348,000 American deaths in 2009 were attributed to either a primary or contributing cause related to hypertension. And billions of dollars are spent on managing and of course treating the complications of hypertension every year because not only life but also productivity is lost 
as a result. Only 47%, which is less than half of those with hypertension, have the condition under control. 30% of American adults, and again we can extrapolate that this is probably true for Southern Africa, about 30% of American adults have prehypertension. There are two kinds of complications that face a person who has hypertension and they may be short-term and long-term. The short-term complications generally result from extreme high blood pressure and the most significant uh, example of this is a stroke or a cerebrovascular accident due to a bursting of a blood vessel in the brain. The long-term detrimental effects of hypertension are more common. They include coronary artery disease, kidney disease, congestive or a swollen heart failure, eye problems and cerebrovascular disease. Mild hypertension can often be controlled with diet and exercise, but medication may be necessary to keep blood pressure within tolerable limits for many people. There are many classes of drugs and we have an entire part uh, in this chapter 2 a little bit later where we talk about medication. But drugs are often used to treat hypertension and all medication has side effects as do antihypertensive drugs. And individuals may need to select or change medication depending on whether it's effective or not and also whether it is a potential risk factor for diving because certain antihypertensive drugs are not really ideal for divers. One of those groups specifically are the beta blockers. Now the beta blockers if you like can be compared to the hand brake on a car. In other words it's as if it applies the brake on the speed of the car but at the same time it limits the performance of the car and so the downside is that using a beta blocker may also decrease maximum exercise tolerance it may also affect the airways and in fact even cause something similar to asthma these side effects may not necessarily cause a problem for divers and there are certain classes of beta blockers that are better than others but they are not the first choice. The choice that we would typically recommend are the so-called angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or even better angiotensin receptor blockers. Now that sounds very fancy but essentially what that means is that in the process of the heart and the kidney regulating blood pressure there is a specific process that is regulated by an enzyme and then the enzyme produces a product that stimulates or inhibits the elevations of blood pressure. So you can either affect the enzyme so that it is not as effective in producing this stimulant for high blood pressure or you can actually block the receptor itself. In other words, even if the enzyme is working, the receptor with which the product of the enzyme will interact is essentially blocked. Now we have found that the angiotensin receptor blockers are probably the first choice for divers. And the reason for saying this is that angiotensin converting enzyme blockers sometimes cause a persistent cough. And in fact it may even go unnoticed. So angiotensin receptor blockers are really something that we would recommend people consider as a first-line treatment. Then there are calcium channel blockers, another choice 
but they have the disadvantage that sometimes people can get dizzy if they get up quickly or move from a sitting to a standing position. They're diuretics. Di um, these are drugs that increase the production of urine, but with that comes the loss of valuable minerals and also, of course, loss of fluid or relative dehydration. And those then need to be monitored. So what is the effect of all of this on diving? Well, the big thing is that as long as an individual's blood pressure is under control, the main concern regarding fitness to dive is potentially the side effect of the medication and whether or not the hypertension that was there prior to treatment being started, whether that damage is significant. Most antihypertensive drugs are compatible with diving. But again, as we told you, the angiotensin receptor blockers are probably the best place to start. Heart and kidney function are the target organs that need to be evaluated and individuals who have suffered serious hypertension typically need special tests done for that reason. We don't want uh, antihypertensives to reduce the performance or the ability to exercise in water and so choices need to be made with that in mind. With all of this of course comes long-term screening, not only for the appropriateness of medication but also to make sure that you keep in step and that you're on the right dosage and that there aren't ongoing problems as a result of hypertension such as coronary artery disease. With that we close this section. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to this channel and keep supporting Dan. We need you to be able to produce these educational pieces and which we really hope you enjoy and benefit from. Until next time, safe diving.